Amen. Amen. I'm so excited you finally accepted Jesus. Welcome to the Christian life. It feels so great to take the first step. Thank you so much for helping me. Of course. Are you ready to take the final step? So ready. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Oh my, wow! Did you get it? Did it work? Did you receive the spirit of omniscience? Yes! It worked! Everything makes perfect sense! The Trinity? Got it! Transworld depravity and agent causation? Easy! Homardiology? Millennial significance of miracles? Duh! <sighs> Isn't it great to know everything? Yeah, just one of the many perks of becoming a Christian, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> You remember that day, right? You know, you came, you said yes to Jesus, and then poof, you know, everything made sense. All your questions were answered. You opened the Bible, and you're just like, everything fit into place and, and perfect understanding of everything. No more struggles. I mean, you remember that day, right? That was, right? No, you don't. Because it doesn't, I mean, wouldn't that be wonderful? Or I don't know if it would be wonderful or not, but it would be different, but it doesn't. That, that reality isn't reality. What, what's actually real is that there are challenges. There are barriers. There are things we don't understand. For me, when I became a Christian, I was 15 years old. I'm a 16 years old. Someone gave me a Bible. It, it was actually this same Bible. It was a Revised Standard Version Bible. This is my second Bible. My first Bible, I put on top of my car and drove off and lost it about a year and a half after I'd been a Christian. I had all my notes in it. And I felt terrible until the thought struck me. Maybe somebody needed it and God had it fall into their hands and they, they had the Bible. That was how I made myself feel better. This is my second Bible. But um, I remember getting the Bible and my instructions with the Bible were, you're a Christian now, you're supposed to read this book. Get started. So I started in Genesis and went, read to Revelation and kind of kept, you know. And, and actually when I hit one part of the Bible that really confused me, I, went, I was 16 years old. I went to a Christian bookstore and I said, I want a book about this part of the Bible. It turns out it was the Minor Prophets, the 12 Minor Prophets. And I bought my first commentary at 16 years old. I know that's a little twisted and weird. Uh, but uh, as a 16-year-old, I wanted to understand what it meant. And there was all these questions. And I will tell you, if you go out and get a commentary to study a portion of the Bible, and all a commentary is is a scholar's efforts to explain in greater detail what's in the biblical text. Some commentaries are really good and really helpful and very biblical, and some are really bad and liberal and horrible. And so if you're looking for a good commentary, go to our uh, cafe and say, we've got a couple series of commentaries we recommend. We can order for you and get a discount for you. But, we, uh, but for me, this was a great commentary. This helped make sense of things. But what I discovered at 16 years old was I didn't have all the answers. I didn't have a moment where I went, poof, and it all made sense. And what I've discovered at 51 years old, 35 years later, I still don't have all the answers. I don't have it all figured out. There's times where I'm going along on my journey of faith, and I hit certain barriers along the way, questions, struggles. And this next Six or seven weeks in this summer, we're thinking about some of those barriers we bump into. We finished a series called Intellectual Barriers to Faith. We talked about some of those things that are more the classical intellectual things, those challenges that come like last week, the problem of evil. How can God be all loving and all good and still allow evil to exist? And if you weren't here last week, go online and watch that message. But, but we finished with that series that's more the hardcore intellectual. Now we're just talking about the real life barriers, those practical barriers that you bump into Either as you're walking towards Jesus for the first time, maybe you say, I'm not yet a Christian, but I'm, I'm here at Shoreline. I have friends that are Christians. I'm trying to figure it out. And as you're trying to figure out Jesus and walking towards him and trying to understand what he's about, there's some things you're going to hit. There's some barriers you're going to bump into. And what do you do with those? We're going to talk about that this summer. And even when you're a follower of Jesus, you've given your heart to him, whether it was you know, four weeks ago or four months ago or 40 years ago, as a Christian walking with Jesus, there's times in your walk of faith that you bump into certain barriers and you just kind of go, man, this is tough. I don't understand this. Or there's things you bump into that can kind of slow down your progression of spiritual growth. What do you do with those things? That's what we're talking about this summer. And today, specifically, we're looking at this one question. Can I love and follow Jesus if I still have questions about faith and struggles in my life? Can I love and follow Jesus if I don't have all the answers and if I still have struggles? If you're not a Christian yet, 
Can you come to faith in Jesus when you still have questions about faith? When you still have struggles in your own life? Or, or should you, if you're, if you're seeking Jesus and trying to understand who he is, and you say, or should I, I hit this barrier, well, I don't have it all figured out, and my life's not all together. You should just wait there until you have all the answers, until your life is all together. When you can present your life to God and say, okay, God, I've cleaned myself up, and I'm good enough now. And there's people who wait there for a long time. A long, 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 long time. Trying to get their life all cleaned up and trying to get all the answers. Now, here's the dilemma. I'm a pastor. I've been a Christian for 30, 36 years now. And I don't have all the answers. And my life's not perfect. I'm cleansed by Jesus. When I stand before God someday, he's going to say, you're clean because of Jesus. But as I walk through this life, I still mess up. I don't live a perfect life. So if you're not a Christian and you're, you're walking towards Jesus, but part of your thinking is, I, I'm not going to really make that commitment to Jesus as long as I have questions and as long as I still have issues in my life, it might be a really long wait to get all that figured out. And if you are a Christian and you're walking with Jesus, but you say, can I really walk boldly? Can I walk strongly when I still have questions, when I still have struggles? That's what we're going to think about today. That's what we're going to grapple with today. Uh, some people, wait to follow Jesus until their questions are all answered and they pull their life together. Some people wait until they've got it all together and the problem is you're going to just keep on waiting. In other words, if you wait that, that way, you never come to Jesus. Their barrier is their own view of faith and the Christian life. Some people who are not yet followers of Jesus believe that you can't come to faith till you, till you have it all figured out. I mean, I can't come to God if I still have questions. And so they wait. I can't come to God. I, I've talked to people who said this, who've said, well, I, I'm thinking about becoming a Christian, but i got a lot of challenges and issues in my life, and I'm going to try to get my life cleaned up a little bit first. Can I just say, don't do that. Don't try to get yourself all cleaned up, because you know what? You're never going to look at your life and say, okay, now I'm clean enough for God. That's why Jesus came. That's why he died on the cross, to wash us clean, to give us new life. So how do we, how do we walk with God even when we have questions, even when we have struggles? I want to introduce you to a few people in the Bible. Just regular people of incredible faith, incredible boldness, incredible strength and love for God, and yet struggles and challenges and questions and issues. As a matter of fact, every character you can find in the Bible, except for Jesus, who was perfect, had challenges. I want you to meet John the Baptist. I, I call his short story... With the, when theological certainty meets suffering and life's struggles. What happens when theological certainty <clears throat> bumps into suffering and life's struggles? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Gospel of John, and if you have a Shoreline Bible, the page numbers are, are on, the, on the screen. John 1, verse 23. And John the Baptist has come, and he's beginning his ministry, and he says this about himself. In John 1, 23, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. John the Baptist had this understanding that he came to point the way to Jesus, to prepare the way for Jesus. He was the forerunner of the Messiah. So here he comes and he understands his role. I'm going to point to the Messiah. When I see the Messiah, I'm going to tell people, follow him. In verse 29 of John chapter 1, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He pointed people back to the book of Exodus when the people of Israel were set free from Egypt with the Passover where the Lamb was slain and the blood was put over the doorposts. And he said, this Jesus, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If you receive him, if his blood that he's going to shed on the cross is placed on your heart, death will pass over and you'll live forever. He, all this theology wrapped up in this one statement. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He calls this, call, says this of Jesus. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Here's John the Baptist. He understands his theology. He understands who Jesus is. He knows this is my role. I must decrease. Jesus must increase. He points people to Jesus. He tells his own disciples, follow Jesus. He gets it. He's solid. He's strong. His theology is just rock solid. And yet you go a little further in his life, and he's been arrested. He has actually called out Herod, King Herod, a political leader, 
And, he, and King Herod was actually in a sexual relationship with his brother's wife. And John the Baptist calls him to holiness, and he calls him to repent, and he points it out. And this guy throws him in jail. So now John the Baptist is in jail. And he can't be pointing to Jesus anymore because he's in jail. But he has his disciples coming back and reporting what Jesus is doing, what he's teaching, the healings, the miracles, all that's going on. He keeps getting reports about Jesus. And then we see, as time goes on, he's in jail, and there's this sense that John the Baptist is wondering, am I ever going to get out of here? He, he understands he might die in jail. And in Matthew 11, verses 2 and 3, we read this. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he said to his disciples, to his own disciples, John's disciples, he sent them to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Isn't that strange? Are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Or should we look for someone else? Here's John the Baptist. He must increase. Jesus must increase. I must decrease. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But now he's in jail. He's under the cloud of potentially his own death. And he died in jail. He, never, he, he was executed in that jail. His head taken off. He's in the shadow of all of that. And he sends his followers to go and check in with Jesus and say, Are you the one? Is it really you, or should we look for someone else? What happened between those two things? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Are you the one? What happened? Let me tell you what happened. Life. Pain. Struggle. Heartache. Imprisonment. An unjust imprisonment. The shadow of death looming in front of him. And he struggled. You say, well, how can that happen? How can someone like John the Baptist, that strong, struggle in doubt? Here's the answer. You ready? He was a person. He was a human being. And he believed in Jesus. He knew he was the Messiah, but he still struggled. But you know what he did? He kept pressing on. And he held fast, even to the point of dying. That's what real Christians do. It's not that there's no barriers, no struggles, no questions, no doubts. They keep pressing on and following Jesus through those things. I want you to meet Peter. His short story I call The Solid Rock Who Became Shifting Sand. Peter, who loved Jesus. Peter, who was passionate about his faith. Peter, who would, who would give anything for Jesus, who, would, who, just, who was just wanting to live for Jesus no matter what it cost, no matter what happened. So Jesus is just gathered with his disciples, and he's talking, this is Matthew chapter 16. He's gathered with his followers, and he's asking them, who are people saying that I am? What's the word on the street? What are people saying about me? And they say, well, some people say you're one of the prophets, and, some say, and they kind of give out these different theories. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And who responds? It's Peter. Verse 15, Jesus says, what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? And verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He got it. Peter says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. My Father, only, you can only know this from the Father. And he says, and your name will be Petros. Your name is the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. He says, Peter, your faith is so solid. Your faith is so sound. You are so strong in your faith that you can be a leader in the, in the beginning of this whole movement of the church that's going to change the world. It's going to the gospel. He says, Peter, you are so solid. You are so strong. Your new name is Petros, the rock. And on this rock, I'll build my church. It doesn't mean that the whole church is built on one person, but it means, Peter, your faith is so strong and so stable, I can build, a, build things on you. That's Peter. But we also know that a short time later, Jesus is arrested, and he's going to go to the cross. And Peter, like all the disciples, runs away when Jesus is arrested. But then he begins to kind of follow at a distance. And finally, they're going through this, this process. They're going to put him through these trials and all this, this kind of this mock process of justice. And, and they have Jesus in this courtyard under guard. And Peter kind of works his way into, quietly into the courtyard. There's lots of people there. And Peter's kind of sitting watching to see what's going to happen with his friend Jesus. And someone walks up to Peter and says, Hey, you, you're one of that guy Jesus' disciples, aren't you? And in Matthew 26, verse 70, it says, but he denied it before all of them. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, he said, you're, you're one of Jesus' disciples. I don't know what you're talking about. And then a little bit later, somebody else comes up and says, no, no, I recognize you. You were with Jesus. Verse 72, Peter denied it again, this time with an oath. 
I swear I don't know the man. A little bit later, someone comes up and says, wait, no, your accent. I recognize that accent. You're one of the disciples of Jesus. Verse 74. Then he began to call down curses and swore to them, I don't know the man. Peter says, may I be cursed if I know Jesus? I swear I don't know the man. And the Gospel of Luke tells us that at that moment, the eyes of Jesus and the eyes of Peter met. Jesus heard everything that Peter said, one of his closest friends in the world. He saw Peter publicly deny him three times. And I don't think that Jesus looked at Peter at that moment with anger or bitterness. I think there was just love and sadness and an awareness. I mean, who who is Peter? Is he the guy who understands that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God, or is he the guy that when the pressure's on, denies him three times? Which of those really is Peter? What's the answer? Both. Both. Have you ever been there? You ever been there in your own life if you're a follower of Jesus? Have you had that moment where you just, you felt so close to God and so committed to his word and so in love with Jesus? God, I love you. I'm following you. I'm pursuing you. Nothing's getting in the way. And you know, that thing I used to do, that attitude I used to have, that's gone never again. And that behavior I used to be involved in, I'm never doing that again. I am, I'm feeling like the rock. I'm, dun, 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 dun. I'm, 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 I'm rocky, right? I'm, I'm like Peter. I'm strong. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. I'm going to live for you. If everyone else turns against you, I never will. Peter said that. If everyone else denies you, never will I. You ever been there? You feel so strong. I'm not going to struggle with that sin anymore. God, I'm telling you right now, never again. And then about a week or a month or two months later, you go, how did I get here? I thought that attitude was out of my soul and out of my heart. I thought that behavior was behind me, and here I am again. Or somebody says something about your faith, and you kind of give a response that's like, a Jesus who, what? And you kind of back off instead of standing for your faith. You ever been at one moment rock solid, and the next moment you're kind of like quicksand, just whoosh. You ever been there? I think all of us have. That was Peter's journey. That can be our journey. And that can become a barrier where we say, we say God, I, how can I follow you when I act like this, when I do this, when, I, when at one moment I'm so strong and the next moment I'm just so weak? How can that be? Peter knew what he believed and was rock solid in his convictions. And he denied that he even knew Jesus when the pressure was on. All in one person, great faith, and great weakness, great strength, a rock, and great struggle, quicksand, all in one person. I want you to meet Mary and Martha. Their little short story I call Loving Jesus and Questioning His Ways and His Timing. Mary and Martha loved Jesus. They served Him. They worshiped Him. They sought after Him. They knew Him. They knew who He was, and they loved Him. But they had a moment It was really difficult in their lives. Their brother Lazarus was really sick. I mean, sick like about to die sick. And they call for Jesus. They send a message. Jesus, will you come to Bethany, the city where we live? Because we know, Jesus, if you come, you can heal our brother. We don't want to lose him. Jesus, will you come and heal him? They ask Jesus to come. Jesus waits a couple of days before he comes. And in those couple of days, their brother Lazarus dies. They put him in a tomb. He begins to decompose. He's dead. He's dead. He's in a tomb. And then Jesus shows up. How do Mary and Martha, who love Jesus, who are committed to Jesus, how do they respond when Jesus shows up? Look at John chapter 11 with me. They, first, first, Martha goes outside of town as Jesus is coming toward them, and she has a conversation with Jesus. John 11, verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, My brother would not have died. Jesus, where were you? Why didn't you come quicker? If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Down in verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Both of them questioned Jesus, his timing, the way he responded to their need. Again, if you weren't here last week for the message, watch it online, that that question of how can God be loving, all loving, and all powerful 
And yet, how can these things happen? How can Mary and Martha are saying, how can we lose our brother? And they're grieving over that. Here's Mary and Martha. They love Jesus. They believe in him. They put their faith in him. But they struggle. Jesus, you didn't behave the way we thought you should behave. You didn't come when we thought you should come. You didn't do what we thought you should do. Have you ever been there? I think all of us have at some point or another. Jesus, I love you. I believe in you. I've given my heart to you. If you're a Christian, I've given my heart to you. But I struggle. Why did this happen? I don't understand your ways, God. I don't understand your timing. I don't understand the things that happen around me. And is it okay to come to God? Is it okay to come to Jesus and say, I'm struggling? Well, Mary and Martha did it. I said, Jesus, we don't understand. Now, Jesus knew that within a short time, he would raise Lazarus from the dead. I mean, literally right there, dead man, alive again. And then at the end of his life, Lazarus would die, but at the resurrection, Jesus would raise him again. But they didn't know that. So they came with their struggles, and they came with their pain. What do you do in those times? If you're a follower of Jesus, where you say, Jesus, I believe in you, and I love you, and I worship you, but... Sometimes I don't understand why things go the way they go and why things happen the way they happen. And if you're, if you're somebody who's searching and seeking, you say, I'm not a Christian yet, but I'm open, I'm interested, and I want to know more about Jesus, but you come to those moments where you say, I don't understand why things happen in this world they do the way they do. I don't understand why there's the pain that there is. You say, that's a barrier for you. How do you move beyond that? Can you love Jesus and follow him even when you don't understand why things go the way they go in this world? And I'll say this, you, you have to learn to because you'll never fully understand what happens in this world. And if you're a Christian and you're trying to follow Jesus, you're trying to walk with Jesus, and you say, Jesus, I love you and I worship you and I give you my whole heart and I want to live for you, but Jesus, sometimes there's things that happen or there's things that have happened recently and I feel stalled in my faith and I have a hard time opening the Bible and reading it and I have a hard time praying and feeling close to you because things have happened that I don't think should have happened. Jesus, if you'd only been here, my brother Lazarus wouldn't have died. If Jesus, if you only would have done this. What do you do when you're stuck in that place, that barrier where you say, Jesus, I love you, but I don't understand. And sometimes that, that moment, that place stops you from growing and thriving and seeking after Jesus. And you say, I still believe, but my faith feels pretty empty right now. And the passion's gone. How do you press through that? Is there a way to press through it? And I believe there is. But I want to tell you one more story but one more person. John the Baptist, Peter, Mary and Martha, all of them, people who loved God, believed great theology, and they struggled. One more, Thomas. I call Thomas a faith-filled doubter. A faith-filled doubter. Most people know the story of Thomas, even if you didn't grow up going to church, even if you don't have a church background, you've heard the term doubting Thomas. That comes from the Bible. This guy Thomas, when, when Jesus had died on the cross... Thomas was one of his followers. When Jesus had died on the cross, he rose, Jesus rose again, and he showed up in a room with a bunch of the disciples, a bunch of the followers of Jesus. But Thomas wasn't there. And so Jesus shows up, and he teaches, and he reveals himself, and they're, just, they're amazed. And they, they, Jesus is alive, and their lives are transformed through the resurrection. But, Pete, but, but Thomas wasn't there. So when Thomas shows up after Jesus is gone, they all say, Thomas, Jesus is risen. He's alive. He showed up. Thomas says, I don't believe it. He said, I won't believe it. And Thomas actually says this. He says, I will not believe that Jesus is alive until I can see him standing in front of me and take my finger and literally put it in the hole in his hand where they drove the nails. So Thomas said, if I can't put my finger in the hole in his hand, Thomas says, then I want to take my hand and his side where they thrust the spear when Jesus was dying on the cross. He said, if I can take my hand and put it in the gouge in his side where they thrust the spear. And I can see the risen Lord touch his hand, finger in the hole, hand, then I'll believe. Until that, I will not believe. That's what we hear about Thomas, doubting Thomas. Can I tell you a story about Thomas that you probably haven't heard? A lot of you probably haven't heard this story. I mean, you say, well, Thomas was just this big doubter. No, he wasn't. He was a man of incredible faith. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 11. And in John chapter 11, verses 6 through 8, we read this. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, this is part of what was bringing Jesus to, back to the city of Bethany. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, Jesus stayed there, uh, stayed where he was two more days. 
And when he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you. They tried to kill you, execute you. And yet you're going back? Jesus says, if I, I'm going to go help Lazarus and Mary and Martha. We're going back to Judea. And they said, well, we, the last time we were there, they tried to kill you. And watch what comes next in verse 16. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. That's Thomas. Let's go with Jesus. Let's die with Jesus. Doubting Thomas? I mean, Jesus says, I want to go back to Judea. I want to help Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Who's I want to go back. And the disciples are like, Jesus, last time you were there, they tried to kill you. If we go back there, they may kill you and they may kill us. And it's Thomas who says, let's go with Jesus even if we die. Which side of the disciples' discussion would you have been in at that point? Let's stay away from Judea, where they're trying to kill us, or let's go to Judea even if we have to die. It was Thomas who said, let's go with him even if we have to die with him. He was a man of incredible faith and incredible courage and incredible boldness. But when Jesus died, and when he rose again, Thomas was sort of an, an empiricist. I have to have data, information, evidence. I want to touch his hands. I want to touch his side. And so you know what Jesus does? The resurrected Christ shows up to Thomas. And I love it. He looks at Thomas. He says, Thomas, come here. Take your finger and put it right in the hole in my hand. Thomas, come here. Take your hand and put it right in the gouge in my side. If that's what it takes you to, for you to believe, then come here and touch me. And the text in John chapter, the, the text in, in John chapter 20 is actually, uh, indicates that, that Thomas didn't bother with touching and touching. When he saw Jesus, he just said, my Lord and my God, and he worshiped him. But which one of those pictures portrays Thomas? Was Thomas this man of courage and boldness? I'll die with Jesus. Or was he a doubter? and struggling to believe that Jesus was risen. What's the answer? Both. And that's where so many of us live, if we're honest. Thomas was committed enough to die for Jesus, but he also was struggled with embracing the miraculous resurrection of Jesus. Have you ever been there? Are you there today? I mean, you believe in Jesus. You say, oh, Jesus, I'll give anything for you. And yet there's moments where you struggle. You read something in the Bible, you look at how, how faith works, and you, just, and, you, and you struggle. You say, I believe, and I'll give anything for Jesus, but man, I struggle sometimes. What does it look like to hit this barrier of having doubts and struggles and questions and parts of your life that just don't line up with what you know you believe? If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, but you're open and you're, and you're interested and you're curious and you're here because you're like, I want to I know more. I've seen friends and family members, their lives change through Jesus. I want to know if this is true. And so you're walking towards Jesus and you're trying to understand and you're coming to shoreline or you're listening or somebody's listening online and they're learning about Jesus. And they say, but you know what? I hit this barrier where I look and I say, I have questions and I have doubts and I have struggles. And my life doesn't totally align with what that whole Christian thing is about. So maybe I'll just stay on this side of the barrier. Can I tell you, if you wait to come to know Jesus till everything makes sense, until your life is all tidied up, you're going to wait a really long time. I didn't have all the answers when I was you know, 15, almost 16, when I became a Christian. I had a lot of questions, but I knew enough. I knew that God loved me. I knew that Jesus was God who left heaven and came to this world and that he really died on the cross for my sins and rose again. And I needed him to wash me clean. That's about what I knew. But it was enough to change my life. My life was not perfect. My life was not all cleaned up. And I can tell you, 35 years later, there's still stuff God's cleaning up. There's still attitudes he's changing and behavior. He's, behaviors he's going, you know what, Kevin? We've got to deal with this. If I'd have waited here on this side of the barrier until I had myself all cleaned up, I would have never crossed it. And those of you that are Christians, you wouldn't have either but you know enough and you believe enough, you take that step and you press through. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if you know Jesus and you love him and you say, I'm seeking to walk with Jesus, I'm seeking to follow him, but along the way of your journey of faith, you've been following Jesus, you've been living for him and there were points where you were passionate and committed and growing, but you sort of hit this barrier. 
And something's happened where you're, you're questioning and you're struggling and you're doubting. And, and maybe for some of you, you just sort of, you're not really pursuing Jesus. You're not really growing in your faith. I, I believe, I'm in, I get it, I'm a Christian. But you've kind of bumped into your own struggles, your own questions, your own life where you make bad choices and you've sort of stopped here. I want to challenge you. Push through it. Keep walking with Jesus. Even if your legs are cramped and your legs are wobbly, even if it's hard along the way, keep pressing forward. When you have doubts and struggles and challenges, that's why we're doing this whole series this summer because we all do. We all hit barriers. The question is, are we going to say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I'm staying here, or I believe in Jesus and I am pressing on and I'm going to keep growing in my faith. If you're not yet a believer, press on to know Jesus. And if you are a believer, press on to keep walking with Jesus. So what does that look like? How, how do we press on? How do we press on like, like a John the Baptist, like a Peter, like a Mary and Martha, like a Thomas, real people with real struggles but still pressing on in faith? How do you walk with Jesus even when your legs are wobbly and it's hard? There's going to be moments where you feel great and strong and you're just running forward in your faith. Praise the Lord. Enjoy those times. They're wonderful. But there's going to be times where you bumped into some things. And you feel like, I believe, but man, I'm not pressing forward. How do you keep moving forward? Here's the first thing. Never sin so that grace may abound. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great Lutheran pastor who was actually killed under, under uh, Hitler's uh, you know, Nazi regime, he was this great Christian pastor who was helping uh, you know, people follow Jesus and know Jesus through the midst of all that time. He, he wrote a book called the, uh, the Cost of Discipleship, and he called it Cheap Grace. When we know the grace of Jesus, and yet we just say, well, you know, here's the deal. I'll sin on Friday night, because I know Sunday morning I can ask God to forgive me. I'll sin all week long, because I know I can say, God, I'm sorry, and he'll wash me clean. Bonhoeffer called that cheap grace. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 wrote this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, this amazing, theologically rich statement of faith and life and, and, and baptism and cleansing. And he begins by saying this in Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? The Apostle Paul says... Here, Here's what's happening at that time. People are saying, okay, now listen. Whenever we sin, if you're a Christian, when you sin, God has grace to cover your sin. And that's true, theologically true. When I sin, God's grace is enough to cover my sin. So if I sin more, I get more grace. And grace is good. So I can keep sinning and grace will keep abounding. Paul says, should we keep sinning just because God will give us grace every time we sin? And then he says, may it never be so. There's four ways to say no. In the Greek language, there's four ways to say it. And each one gets more intensive. And, and the fourth one is the most intense of all. This is the way, this is, it, may it never be, may God forbid it, may we never do that. Should we keep sinning just because grace abounds when we sin? May it never be so, God forbid it. When you're walking with Jesus and you're struggling and you hit, the, you hit those points, those barriers in your faith where, where, where with questions or struggles or with life choices and you're just not living the way you should, that's when Satan comes in and says, you know what? Just do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. God will forgive you anyways. Should we keep sinning that grace may abound? Can I just challenge you? Don't buy that lie. Don't just keep sinning because, well, God will forgive me. It doesn't matter. But battle against sin and seek to walk in holiness. But the second thing is this, and this is why it's so challenging. Here's the second thing. In walking with Jesus, even on wobbly legs, embrace grace freely as it's given. If you want to keep pressing forward and walking with Jesus, that when you do sin, when you do struggle, when you do fall, God says, my grace is enough. So we don't sin that grace may abound, but when we do sin, grace does abound. You get it? But the point is not just, I'll do whatever I want because God gives me grace. But the point is to keep following Jesus and walking on wobbly, cramped legs, pressing forward. But when I fall, when I struggle, when I sin, I know his grace is always enough. And I have to receive that grace and be cleansed and strengthened to keep walking with Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. This passage is so powerful. And you could spend a month studying just these few verses and you wouldn't begin to scratch the surface of the depth of all that's here. But listen to what God speaks through the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. Chapter two, verse four. But because of God's great love, because of his great love for us, 
God who is rich in, what's the word? Mercy. God who is rich in what? Mercy. Made us alive. Listen to this. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. When we were dead and could do nothing, God through Christ made us alive. Amazing. It is by, what does it say? Grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him, with Christ, in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his, what's the word? Grace. This amazing, undeserved gift of Jesus. Grace, cleansing, freedom. The incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I want you to read five words with me. For it is by, read this, grace you have been saved. It is by, read it again, grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by your works, nothing you did. So that no one can boast, no bragging. Look what I did. No, it's by grace through Jesus. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We'll do good things for God, but not so we can get him to love us. He already loves us. He's already taken us from death to life. He's already seated us in the heavenly realms. We do good works because God loves us and he's been so good to us. So first, we don't sin that grace may abound. When we're pushing towards Jesus and we're willing to walk with him, we don't just say, oh, I can do whatever I want because he's going to forgive me. We seek to walk the way he wants to walk. But when we do struggle, we always turn to Jesus and his grace always lavishes us and fills us. It's always enough. So we receive grace when we struggle. And then, the third thing, as we walk with Jesus on wobbly legs, cramped legs, pressing forward, walking with him, even when we hit barriers, we seek holiness passionately as God has called you. You seek holiness. In 1 Peter Chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, we read these words. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, we we set our hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Don't live the way you used to live. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in what? All you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. That's the voice of God. That's from Leviticus 11, 44. Be holy for the Lord your God is holy. We don't treat grace cheaply. We don't say, I'll just do whatever I want because God will forgive me. But when we do stumble in sin, we always receive his grace. We get back up again and we keep pressing forward and we seek after holiness to live more like Jesus. And as you're walking, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're walking on wobbly legs, on cramped legs, pressing forward, and you have doubts and struggles and challenges in your life, you just, are, you, are you just going to hit that barrier and say, you know, these challenges are too much, my questions are too much, I believe in Jesus, but that's enough, I'm not going to really live for him. And I want to just invite you, don't do that, but press on. And you press one step at a time, and you say, God, I want to follow you, and I want to live for you, and I want to seek you. And it's hard sometimes, and I have questions, and I have doubts, and I mess up, and I rely on your grace, but I want to become more and more like Jesus. We have two powerful words that kind of describe this journey of coming to Jesus and walking with Jesus. The first word is salvation. What is salvation? This is the moment you receive the grace and love of Jesus. You confess your sins. A new life begins. Sin is washed away. The Holy Spirit moves in, and you become a child of the living God. You have new life. You're born again. That's salvation. It happens in a moment when you understand Jesus died on the cross, rose again, took my sins. I need his forgiveness. I receive Jesus. That's salvation. It happens in a moment. And when that happens, no one can take that away from you. You might stumble, you stumble, you might bump into barriers, but you belong to Jesus. But there's another word, there's another theological truth that we have to hold on to, and that is the word sanctification. What is sanctification? That is a journey that begins the moment you receive salvation. That moment you receive Jesus, then this journey of sanctification begins, and it lasts a lifetime. You're becoming more like Jesus, understanding his word with greater clarity. Worshiping with increasing passion, serving with deeper joy, giving with growing generosity, repenting of sin more quickly. 
When you realize that you're sinning that grace is about, you go, that, I don't want to do that. And you stop, you repent, you turn around. Salvation happens in a moment when you receive Jesus. Sanctification is the journey of the rest of your life. Becoming more like Jesus. And sometimes you run that race and you're strong and you feel like you just, you just you go in full speed. Praise the Lord. But sometimes you bump into a barrier of your own questions, your own doubts, your own choices. And I want to say don't get stuck there. But press on. Even if you're walking on cramped legs or even if you're on the ground crawling, crawl one more inch, one more foot towards Jesus. Rely on his grace. Seek holiness and keep pressing forward. That's the journey of sanctification. Sometimes it's easy and you feel like the wind's at your back and the temperature's perfect and you're running hard. You go, it's going to always be like this. Praise the Lord. And then you hit hard times. You go, man, I want to keep pressing towards Jesus. And, and so the question we're asking is this. Can I love and follow Jesus if I still have questions about faith and struggles in my life? And the answer is, you better be able to. Because all of us are going to hit those moments. We're going to face those times. If everyone who has questions and struggles in their faith at one time or another was to leave this room right now, guess what? No one would be here. If we're honest. If I said to you, if you're a follower of Jesus and you never struggle and you never doubt and you never feel winded or you never feel tough, more, you never hit barriers along the way, you never make bad choices, if I was going to say, you know, raise your hand if that's you. No one's going to raise their hand. Now, if I say, are you completely cleansed through Jesus, through faith? Yes. But if I say, is your life perfect right now? The answer is no. So, so there's two kinds of people today. One of those people don't yet know Jesus. They haven't yet received. They're curious. They're checking it out. They're learning. And they may hit this point where they say, listen, I still have questions. That's why I still have questions. And I still have stuff I do in my life that I know God's not happy with. So I'm going to wait to come to Jesus until I get answers for all my questions, until all the struggles in my life are gone. Here's what I'll tell you. Then you'll never come to Jesus. Because there's some answers you won't have till the other side of glory. And there's some struggles that you may battle with for a lifetime as you're growing in sanctification. But if you know, if you believe that, that Jesus came and he loves you, he died on the cross for you, that you need him to cleanse you and you come to receive Jesus, then you can start walking and figuring out some of those questions. 35 years into my journey of faith, um, I have a lot more answers than I ever thought I'd have. But I still have a lot of questions. That's okay. Because I have Jesus and he has me. And if you're a Christian and you've been walking with Jesus and maybe you were running hard, things were going great and all of a sudden you hit this barrier and you question, struggles, God... Why? Like Mary and Martha, if you'd only been here, God, why didn't you fix this? Why didn't you take care of it? Like John the Baptist, you're in a cell, you're in a dungeon, and you're struggling. You say, Jesus, are you really the one? And you hit that point, and you just go, and it's, you're kind of stalled in your faith. Now, I want to challenge you. You make you say, man, my legs are cramped. I'm weary. I'm tired. I'm just kind of sitting here. Will you stand up? You just grab the hands of Jesus. Say, Jesus, help me forward one more step one more step in this journey of sanctification. Jesus, I want to be more like you. And I've been kind of on the pause button for too long. It's time to open my Bible up again and saying, God, feed me through your word. It's time to start talking to God in prayer again. It's time to start serving. I don't know what it is. But will you press on on wobbly legs striving towards Jesus? And one day the race will end and you'll fall into the arms of Jesus. He'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Press on. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for those brothers and sisters here today that are here at Shoreline for the first time or they've been part of the church for 20 years. We love those moments when we run strong and the wind's at our back and you just feel like we just feel so good and strong in our faith. We love those moments. We delight in those. But, oh, Jesus, in those moments where the questions are, are deep and thick and real and where our struggles seem to be impossible for us to overcome in our own strength, help us to press on. Help us to keep seeking you and growing and living for you. I pray for those that have kind of stalled, that have kind of just sitting still and not, they believe in you, Jesus. They love you. They know you're there. 
but they're just not growing in their faith. Will you give them a fresh beginning today to get back up and, and even on cramped, weary legs, take one more step towards you, Jesus, growing in sanctification. And Lord, I pray for those who are here today who are wanting to know, God, are you real? And they haven't never received you, Jesus, but they want to know and they, they're waiting until they pull themselves together. They're waiting until they have all the answers. I pray that this would be the day that they would say, I know enough. <laughs> and I'm not going to try to clean myself up. I'm going to come to Jesus just as I am with all my brokenness, with all my struggles. I'm just going to come and say, Jesus, if you could take me like this, you could have me. Because Jesus, your arms are open. If that's you today, when the service is done, would you come to myself or one of the others that are in the front for prayer and just say, today I'm ready to receive Jesus and we'll pray with you today. Jesus, thank you for the greatness of your love. Thank you for the amazing grace you lavish on us. And thank you on this journey of life with all the barriers along the way. We can learn to keep following you and seeking you. Jesus, we pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen. I want to hand the venues off to their venue pastors. They'll have a few things to share with you. And here in this room, I want to just give you a couple quick invitations. Number one, if you are a new believer, if either you want to pray to receive Jesus today, come forward, or if you've received Jesus in the last few months, or maybe you just say, I'm, I became a Christian, but I didn't take those first steps of really getting into the word and prayer and growing in faith. We have a class today from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, lunch is included, upstairs here in the garden room. Just go up there at 1 o'clock, come back at 1 o'clock today and just say, it's, it's, it's the Believer's Path class. It's two hours long. And they're going to give you some basics for those first steps of the Christian faith. If you've not taken those steps, come to that class today and just join them and be part of that time from 1 to 3 o'clock. And also, if you are a leader in any context, sign up online or here at the Connection Center for this, uh, this leadership community gathering next Sunday night. If you want prayer, come forward for prayer. And if you're new at Shoreline, we have a lot of military that come into town this time of year. If you're new at Shoreline, please do one thing for us. Go by the Connection Center out these doors to the left and just say, I'm new here. And they want to give you a gift. They want to thank you for coming. They want to answer your questions. Help you see if this is the right church for you. It may be the right church. There might be another church that's a better church for you. We'll find out what it is. We'll send you there. We just want to help you get connected and grow in faith. Find a great Christian church. And so if you're new at Shoreline, go by the Connection Center. They'll help you along. God bless you. Have a great week and walk in God's grace. Amen.